stats, stories, how you use them. T minus three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. Welcome to the BizDoc case study. I am here with my vault, getting jacked up, getting my brain revved up for you. We've got some great stats here, and we've got a wonderful case study. We're going to dive into mortgages and home prices. Is it a market response, or is there a crisis brewing, or is it a little bit of both? And as usual, I'm here at Kellyanne, the Swiss Army Knife, pulling the charts, looking things up when I can't remember them <laughs> while I talk. And we've got a great lineup of stats. And like I say, what flavor do I have today? I got cucumber mint. Ooh, my second favorite. You like cucumber mint? I love it. Cucumber mint is like the number two for everybody in my household. I like the watermelon. My wife thinks they're that a um, little bit of a tie between the watermelon and black cherry. And then the two daughters seem to be on the black cherry. And then, um, you know, everybody's second place on the cucumber mint. Anyway, well, I don't care what flavor it is. You know, whatever it takes to get my brain revved up in the morning, I'm in favor of. All right, so first thing, first stats. And by the way, everything on this episode, if you're looking at this a year from now, and we're filming this at the end of third quarter, 2023. So it's here in September, 2023, getting ready to finish up a third quarter, you know, conflicting headlines about things are good, things are bad. You get politicians spinning it, but the people that know what's going on is you, especially if you are the one that's running a business as an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, or you're, you're working for one, or you're thinking about leaving a company and going for it. We hope all of this is helpful to you because there's a ton of stuff for you to use today. So Kellyanne, let's go to the first one. Kind of a bad news story, but there's, there's, there's a story behind the story. Yeah, and this comes to us by our good friends at Whale Wire. You know, at Whale Wire, you can find them on Twitter. But they pull a lot of data like this together. And uh, they got this from Apollo, and they put some of their own analysis to it. But take a look at 2023. Bankruptcy filings, look, look, they've crossed 8.5%, heading to 9%. And by the way, they've got momentum. There is a backlog of bankruptcy filings coming. These are individual and sole proprietor, because if you own a, um, a food truck and maybe you have one person working in it with you, that food truck probably is on your personal tax return. So the bankruptcy is usually a personal bankruptcy if something happens, because that food truck was on your personal credit and was on, uh, you had what's called a personal guarantee, a PG. So if you had about $50,000 in savings, you had to put that PG, personal guarantee, up for the business loan. So when you have a bankruptcy of an individual, maybe you've had medical expenses during COVID, you lost your job, you maxed out credit cards, and you that's a personal bankruptcy, but also people can't forget that there's a lot of personal bankruptcies on individual sole proprietors, like the food truck example I just gave you. So you take a look at this, and this takes us back almost 20 years. 20 years would be 2003, 2004. And 2003, 2004, you know, that was coming out of that 2001 and 2000 recession we had back there. But six, seven, eight, boom, then we were into this massive, massive bubble in 2006 on housing. And by the end of 2008, the movie The Big Short had been written by, it was going to come later, but it was written by all the facts and things that were happening there. But take a look at this, 2023, as big as 2008. You know, how old were you when you look back at some of this stuff, Kellyanne? I mean, uh, I was born in 91, so... The, I remember the Great Recession in 2008, and COVID was just two years ago, and it was crazy. When you see this, what do you think? Somebody your age sees this coming out. You hear conflicting stories in the news. What are you thinking? The, I'm just concerned about the fact that we had uh, bankruptcies, obviously, during COVID, uh, because you know people were out of a job. Uh, it was harder. The inflation, all that jazz. But yep. now that you know, COVID's over. The government has said we're okay. Everything's fine. We're not in a recession or anything. And yet, uh, bankruptcy filings are higher than when they were during COVID. Yep, e exactly. So it leads a lot of people to think that it's not going to be a soft landing for the economy. So what you should you be doing about this? So people ask me, and thank you for sending the chats. 
thank you for the super chats and thank you for the uh, questions and the comments that you put down on this. And down at the bottom, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so that you can get notified when the next case study or BizDoc podcast is coming out. So here's what you need to do. If you're, a so if you're in business and you're like a sole proprietor, small business, and you're giving any credit to your customers, like maybe, maybe you and one other buddy are a drywall company, and then you hire a couple workers, there's four or five of you, and you're doing drywall jobs. You gotta keep those general contractors on a shorter lease and in terms of getting paid. And you need to be very, very careful about your own expenditures. This may be the year to make a truck in your business last one more year or two more years more. Um, what would it take for a big maintenance on that truck versus buying a new truck? Unless you have to turn in the lease. And then you may go to the bank and say, how do I extend this? Or how do we negotiate this? Or you go back, sorry, you can maybe go back to the car dealership and say, hey, you know, what do we do Call to talk to FOMOCO Credit, Ford Motor Company Credit, FOMOCO, as they say. And, um, you know, because I know the credit guys, the auto workers may be on strike, but the credit guys at the dealers are not. <laughs> and they'll help you out. But the point is, now is the time when you're looking at this happening is to be keenly aware of things that could pinch you or where you could get pinched. When I say pinch you, that's pinching yourself and then you get pinched by somebody else's problem. So that'd be the BizDoc's advice there is to tread very, very carefully because I think there's an iceberg below the surface here where you only see a little bit of it on top, but there's a lot below and we need to let this shake out. Last week, the Fed did not raise interest rates, but they said, we think we're probably going to raise it on October 31st, November 1st. So you say, okay, what do I do now? Well, the answer is rates and debt and credit cards and mortgages probably going to go up a little bit. But then they said it's going to stay up higher longer and don't look for a rate reduction maybe till April of next year. And that's what I'm hearing from a lot of folks. So it may be this is a season to do it and pay attention to the bankruptcies. Don't be one and don't get hurt because you gave credit to another business or somebody who is going to be one. So the economy is no fun and games right now at all. And not to make a bad segue, but speaking of fun and games, you know, <laughs> I was looking into Nintendo um, and I was looking at Nintendo doing like a, a dive into what's going on as much as I could. And I found a very interesting chart. Check this out. And I suddenly understood headlines I was seeing about Nintendo. So if you take a look at this going back exactly 20 years, 2003, these are all the Nintendo platforms. In other words, the game playing device. And then you would buy all the cartridges or download whatever you did. And that's... That's how you do it. So remember, this was all about cartridges. Um, and I remember the 3DS and the, the DS and the Wii. So do you remember those? Yeah, I had just out of high school, I had a bunch of friends. They always had their backpacks full of cartridges for the, the, the 3DS or whatever it is. And then uh, in, in college, in the dorm room, we would play Wii tennis. And we would accidentally break everything. <laughs> you remember we this? Kept swinging the yeah, you remember around. people playing Wii. That's where you have the controller and you're playing tennis like this, and you move over here and move over there, and whoop, there goes a lamp, you know, or, or you just broke something on a shelf or something. <laughs> I had friends do that. I also had friends lose lose the controller. Do, 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 yeah, it goes woo! flying, there's and a then hole the in the wall. Controller goes flying as as far as the wire would let it, and later they were wireless, and it's like, yep, there it goes. <laughs> so Back to the chart, so take a look at this. So Nintendo was building this mountain of success. The GameCube, the Game Boy, the DS, the 3DS, and you see there's very natural life cycles. It gets issued, oh, it's very popular, and then it has its retreat. And it's a product life cycle called introduction, growth, peak, and then roll off or maturity, and then the next one comes up. And you saw there's, there's the Wii. So basically, 2009, 2010, 2011, right after the uh, Great Recession of 08, man, Nintendo was king of the games. Look at that. 60 million units a year. Then that all rolls down. DS rolls down. And then they're on Switch. But look at what has happened the last three years on Switch. And so it looks like they peaked in 21. And it doesn't look like anything's coming 
behind it. So this is an example of where a company suffers a product drought. And I'd be willing to bet that somewhere at Nintendo, and here's something for you. If you work at your own company, you have a, a company that uh, you've started and you're looking at your products, you have to pay attention. There will be an introduction, there will be growth, there will be a peak, maybe version two, version three, and then it rolls down. It does that way with Facebook. It's happened that way with Snapchat. All of the platforms experience it. And it's worse if you're selling a hardware platform that makes up big dollars for you. Well, so you can even go look and see what happens with Apple. Like, you know, Kellyanne, you know what? They said the new Apple iPhone 15 is one, one quarter of one ounce lighter, but everything else is roughly the same. So if your battery life has gone to crap, you know, which is the, and some people say there's these clever things that happen when they do software updates. I know my battery on mine, I have a 14 and the battery on mine, you know, long about four or five in the afternoon, I got to be plugging it in, mm -hmm. even though it's a full charge in the morning and I've got the, the screen dim and all the things you're supposed to do to save yourself energy on there. <clears throat> the iPhones have the same introduction curve. So what's the lesson for us? The lesson for us, if you're in a product based company and you're just starting out and you haven't had this yet, you can't automatically assume in the spreadsheet, oh, we'll grow 5% next year and 5% next year and 5% next year, or worse, I've seen what's called the familiar hockey stick. Oh, 5%, 7%, 10%, 20% .10 over a course of quarters because, it, you know, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, because your product is so great and people are gonna love it so much, it's just gonna go. Be careful because you get caught out. Just like right now, I think Nintendo's about to get caught out. They're, you know, they talk about new products, talk about stuff, haven't seen them yet. So now they got the Switch and you look at the units they're, they're selling. You know, from 2017, they had a real lull. And then the Switch came out, it hasn't exactly been the savior of the city. It's taken them back to 30 million a year, but that's a far cry from the 40, 50, 60 million of the year that they were cranking out from 08, 09, 10, 11, five year, Span there, they don't. Um, I think they did in excess of 200 million devices. 200 million devices. There's 330 million people in the United States right now. You know that that's like a device for 66 percent of us. So this is big, big numbers now. But you can see what's happening to them. And the same thing, you need to be careful if you've got product life cycle. You need to plan it out and be ready because life is going to change. Life cycles come and go, and you will be part of it. And it's amazing. I talk to entrepreneurs from time to time that don't think about this. And I said, well, you know, how's the app doing? Oh, I did this app. Yeah, it was pretty good. It was pretty good last year. It's a little softer now. Well, maybe there's nothing wrong. It's just you've had your peak, and now what you have to do, you didn't go viral, or it was a standard growth, and now you gotta got to go push and see if you can go further with it. <clears throat> so speaking of mountain of life cycle, let's go back and take a look at the song doesn't remain the same. You know mm -hmm. what the song remain the same was? That was an album by Led Zeppelin. Oh. So yeah, back in 1923, you know, when I was young. Um, <laughs> what was that? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's long ago, <laughs> long ago and far away. Um, um, when Led Zeppelin was playing songs like Boogie with Stu. So anyway, let's take a look at this. And I'm gonna ask you about your music habits, Kellyanne, okay. because you know, um, you were born in 91, mm -hmm. so, um, whoops, I said that out loud. Um, <laughs> so when Napster was happening in 2000, it wasn't you, it was your parents who were suddenly getting access to free downloads yes. as Napster found itself in court. So let's take a look at what happened here. <clears throat> back in the early days, vinyl was everything back in 1980. Then there were cassettes for a while because you could bring them in your car. <clears throat> and then you would also do what I did. I had a cassette deck and I would record a bunch of songs on it, made a playlist, but I had to manually record everything on it. And then my cassettes were my playlists. And, and sometimes you'd buy the album on cassette, but rarely would you do that. Because most of the time cassette, I wouldn't do that because you would go to your friend's car and they would put it in, and if their car was really hot and you mm -hmm. went in to watch a movie, you came out and the car was hot, sometimes the cassette player would eat it. Oh, so no. what just ate was $12 you just paid for, no. you know, REO Speedwagons. You can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. Oh my and gosh. you're like, ah! <laughs> so I only bought vinyl, and then I would make my own recordings on cassettes. 
and those were basically my playlists. And then along came the CD, which was like, they said it was going to be digital vinyl, but it never really sounded as good. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a great, I sp can't say what I spent on my stuff, but um, <laughs> I really spent on a great turntable and a great amp. Oh, cool. So that I would have great sound at home. And I always felt that the CD, although they were easy, you could take them in your car, put them in those little like envelopes, one, two, three, four, five, these yeah. little plastic envelopes, carry them all with you. But um, they had their time and they had their run. And take a look at what happened about the time Napster and all the streaming. There was Napster, there was Pirate, there was um, Bear Share. There's a whole bunch of them in there that basically all end up getting shut down. Mm -hmm. But what happened was streaming, you know, the, as they said, was the genie was out of the bottle. And streaming was there, and the and look how quickly from 2000 to 2005, from a 22, 23 billion dollar industry to a 10 billion dollar industry. Now you see why all the artists were so upset. Well, where are we today? Take a look at what's going on. Look at streaming, paid streaming, and for a time. Did you ever pay for ringtones on your phone, like 99 cents to oh, get yeah. your favorite song? All the time. Now you don't do that anymore. You pay Apple and then you get all kinds of samples of whatever song you want, as long as you have a subscription to Apple Music. So boom, but you've got then downloading songs and then streaming. So now you have streaming making a comeback and vinyl is in there. Do you, do you have vinyl? My brother loves vinyl. He has all these shelves and shelves of vinyl and he's obsessed with it i actually have a lot of friends that are are buying line, vinyl which is just so weird because you think it's old and yet it's is kind of making a comeback but it doesn't seem to be that big compared to streaming you see the headlines you think there's billions of dollars of vinyl being sold yeah but there's really not compared to streaming <laughs> yeah it looks like the the song is not as the actual song is not as loud as the headline but vinyl's on there but you can see streaming and streaming, you know, we have Spotify family, mm -hmm. and I think I also have Apple because I think we, we get it, and we also have, um, you know, iCloud subscription. We have a lot of people. But what can you end up with? You can end up with, what, you, you have SoundCloud. SoundCloud, YouTube, we have a lot of people to office YouTube that have music, YouTube music. Um, uh, Pandora. Pandora. Um, Shazam. Shazam. There's know, something called Tidal, Andres was telling us about. Tidal. Yeah. Look at all these. So you have all these places you can get streaming, and now you, you hear about all the artists being upset because, you know, they only get one-tenth of a penny per song, you know, unless you're Taylor Swift, and you get all the money. And she, she just redoes her whole album. <laughs> right. It's like eras. Eras of money, you know? <laughs> it's like, wow. But anyway... That's what's going on in streaming. So there's another le lesson in there about life cycle, but there's life cycle affected by external variables. You know, streaming destroyed the music industry and then it had to make it come back because all of a sudden people got it for free and the artists had a right to be upset. But if you're playing in that space and you're in music, you may not be a, uh, the reason that something shifted. You may not have done anything, but you may still be having your industry affected by external variables. So I always tell people, how much time do you spend a week just doing a little bit of research? BizDoc does it on Sundays. And Patrick Bet David and I will trade text on Sundays and he knows when I get home from church or in the morning before we go, boom, I'll send some links back and forth of things that I've seen that's sort of interesting because that's when I chill. And for me, that's kind of like, um, you know, a cup of coffee and running through that stuff. It's, it's, it's interesting to me. It's like, it's like uh, you know, I don't read fiction books. So I don't read novels or anything like that. I'll read books with a purpose. Um, and this is like book reading for me. It's like casual. Um, but you also need to be doing it and keep your eyes on the external variables as well as the economic variables like we talked about bankruptcy as well as the life cycles of your own company. Hope that was helpful. We're now going to roll over to Studio B and I'm going to do a deep dive into mortgages mortgage rates and housing cost and a lack of housing sales here in 2023. Is it a crisis? Is there a storm from the outside? Or are we just having a market reaction to the natural forces? See you over in Studio B and let's dive in. Okay. All right. I found my board. All right. Excellent. So what we're going to talk about today is talk about mortgages home prices, is there a crisis? 
Did something weird happen, like a bank crash? Or is it really a confluence of market forces? Let's go take a look. So, crisis or market response? So let's go take a look into this and find out what's going on. Let's start with some stats. First of all, this is what's going on. Mortgage rates have gone up, just as you've heard the last year, Fed in the United States was raising rates quarter point, half point, quarter point, quarter point. We make all the jokes about Jerome Powell going to visit the cheerleader, pounding the cheerleader, and every time he pounds, it cranks out another quarter point. So too bad for the cheerleader and too bad for us. The cheerleader is a metaphor for the U.S. economy, unfortunately. And as you can see, what's happened there is the interest rates at the banks are about five, five and a half now, and that translates to about a 7.75% interest rate. And look, you gotta go all the way back here to before the crash. And they remember they talked about cheap money? It was 6% talking about their cheap money loans. And that's when it crashed from 6%. So when you think about the big short, you think about all the crashes, you think about what's going on with interest rates, it was 6% right when all that was going on, five to 6% when it was so easy to get a, uh, a loan. You know, yeah, what was it, Nina, no income, no assets, and things like that, the banks were it led to the crash of Long Beach, you know, crash of WAMU, you know, DITEC, all those things that went down. Well, it is back with a vengeance, and we are higher than we've been since 2000. So that's why they say interest rates higher than they've been in 25 years. We know all this, but I wanted to put this visually so you can kind of see the peaks and valleys that brought us to today. So this is real. Next part, the home prices. And you say, well, I know about the uh, mortgage rates, BizDoc, but the home prices are the ones that are killing me. So let's go take a look at what's going on in here. You go back here, home prices versus inflation. This is the nominal average, right, for um, following inflations. Look at the home prices. This is up. Here's the crash, 2007, 2008, come all the way down, and it bottomed 2010, and then it was coming back up, coming back up, and then we've had the COVID effect, which, and there's been a little bit of a drop on, on the recovery, but we're 36% overvalued compared to inflation in America. In other words, regardless of inflation, what's happened to housing prices? They are 36% above what the nominal inflation would be, which should be way back down here. That's exactly what people are feeling. They're like, wow, it just seems like houses have gone out of sight along with inflation, and my income didn't keep up. Well, now let's go look at this. So point number one, you saw what's up in mortgage rates. Point number two, the adjusted home prices They've gone up, you know, unless you've really been on a tear with your own income or built a business or something, home prices are more than a third ahead of inflation. Then, now let's go compare that to your income. Here's that same curve that I showed you that you, looks familiar over the same rough time period, but we're starting here to there, and this actually goes back to the 50s. Take a look at this. Housing affordability crisis. Look at what's happening. Wages were kind of tracking back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. There was a bit of a gap. They flattened out a little bit. But look what has happened here in 2020. The income at the bottom, the home prices at the top, there. When income doesn't go up but the home prices have gone up, there's, there's your next point. It's like you're not crazy. It is incredibly unaffordable. Now, <clears throat> let's just do that as a ratio. Let's put a ratio of your income to the home prices and look what happens. Way back here in 1960, 1955, there was this, been uh, about seven years home from World War II, so going way back to your grandparents and great-grandparents here, 4.69 was the number where it was. And this goes, this is the high when they've been measuring way back in the 60s. And you take it all the way through, boom, there's the peak in 08. It got to 4.34, 2006 peak, 2022 peak. Look at this. So you can see that basically, but for the drop after 2008, 
And after 2009-10, where the market bounced back, remember the stock market bounced back in 2009, you can see what's happened here. It's, the affordability is there. So the inflation, you know, people say my wages haven't kept pace with inflation. Well, let me tell you, housing values haven't kept pace with inflation either. They've gone crazy. So you're not crazy. Twice in the last 10 years, uh, 15 years, we have had all-time highs with a lull in the middle. And when we printed all that money and we devalued the dollar, it helped drive asset prices, and that's where they are today. So you're not crazy. The affordability index has never been worse. It's even worse than it was <clears throat> during the bubble where asset prices jumped up in 2006 before the crash of 08. Next we go, now watch this. Why aren't there homes to buy, even in a community that might be affordable? I find a, a smaller town or further from the city. Why can't I find something to buy? Because people don't want to sell their homes. Now this is complicated, but I'm going to make this simple in the next chart. Each one of these lines represents the market share of a certain loan. So we start down here with the sub 3% rate. That's a pretty damn good mortgage. And as you can see, the sub 3% rate, going back 13, 14, 15, 16, boom, 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 all of a sudden, the rates drop and people are refining. And people are refining at sub 3% because they, they heard interest rates could be going up. And that's exactly what people did. There is a race to refi here, and then it peaks and drops down because as we raise the rates, you couldn't get this anymore. So the reason it flattens out, it doesn't grow, is because you can't get it, and people kept it. So when it stays flat, those mortgages are not being uh, what's called, um, uh, those mortgages, so, and as it flattens out, those mortgages are not being paid off through a normal sales transaction. You sell your house, pay it off. Now watch, now let's go sub three, now let's go three to 4% rate. Here we go. Again, it was down here. Pops up, 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 up. Now the 3% rate is 38% all of all mortgages. So today, sub 3%, 23.3, 38, 50, 61% of mortgages are held right now are below 4%. Let's go to the next band. Now we go to the green, 4 to 5%. It was up here. Uh-oh, let's refi. And they go zoom, crashing down. Now it's 19.9%. It was 40%. This went down, this went up. Take a look at the blue. They traded in their green mortgage for the blue mortgage. See the two lines following there? And then lastly, you've got, that's a four to five, five to six and six plus. You can see, remember, 6%. I was telling you, 2008, a lot of five and 6% mortgages. After all that madness, People are just refining or selling homes normal. There's where it goes. So now you can see, we're gonna put all these on two simple bar charts. Now then, 2023, you have got, as we go to the bottom, sub 3%, 3 to 4%, 61%, 4% or less, 81%, 5% or less. There you have it. And rates now, 7.5%. So if you've got 61% of them are 4% or less, and you've got interest rates right now that are 7 and 3 quarters or 8%, that means half of the mortgages in America are half what the current interest rates are. That tells you the whole story. These people are going to Airbnb their house, unless they live in New York where they just made Airbnbs illegal in certain residential areas. They are not going to get let go of that. They're going to keep making the payments on it. And the other thing that's happened with, even if you could afford the mortgage, there's some things going on, such as when that you buy your next house, pay a lot of money for it, more than your prior, prior house, your monthly home insurance is bigger. It's a more expensive asset. It costs more per month in insurance and more expensive assets. Uh-oh, here comes property taxes. That's on there. So it's not just about the mortgage rates. You also have people going, going, wait a minute. Even if I can afford that 
million dollar house, sell a 600, get a million dollar, my property taxes are going to go up. My home insurance is going to go up. So when the asset values suddenly jump and you're trying to upsize the home, you usually used to build in, okay, well, you know, I'll get the same payment, I'll work that out, save some of my money, put it in, sell a house, take some extra money, put it in a new house, get a bigger house. Well, guess what? <clears throat> it comes back to get you. Well, how do we know that this is having a negative impact on the consumer? Default rates for auto loans and credit cards in the last 12 months, actually almost 18 months, going to January of 2022, 20, uh, look what's happening. They're coming up. Why are they coming up? Because inflation is pinching people. They can't afford it. And these people went out, these are car and credit cards being affected by the interest rates. So even if you're in on a sweet 3% mortgage and you're sitting tight on it, guess what? In certain jurisdictions, your property taxes are being assessed every year. So that means your property taxes are going up. Your, the car that you had to replace was a more expensive car loan and the, credit, the rate on the credit card is up. And you were using credit cards to get groceries. This is all interrelated, all interrelated. So now you can see this, and this comes to us, standards and pores and experience default. So this isn't independent research here coming from a think tank. This is from S&P and Experian doing their homework, showing us what's going on. Here's, and by the way, here we have that COVID. And look, coming back up, four to three. When's the last time we've seen four to three? So right in this as a percent. Right in this zone, that was our nominal level. If this breaches here, that means that the default rates are bigger than the historical high, which has hung around four and th three and four percent since January of 2013. See how that works? And then, by the way, look at all the defaults and all the things that was crazy that was going on. Eight percent, seven percent on bankruptcies that were going on right after. Here we have the ginormous market crash of 2008. Uh, triggered by the financial bubble and the real estate bubble. Now then, so those are default rates on credit cards. So what happens if you default on your credit card and your car and then there's no way out? You call somebody and you file for bankruptcy. The, the good guys at Whalewire um, pulled this together uh, from Apollo and their own research. But this lines up with everything I've seen, but I like the way they put it in one chart that was so clear. Our bankruptcy filings have breached this blue line, which is 8.5%. That was the peak. It was like 8.125% was the peak. I mean, 8.625% was the peak here in 2009 after the major financial crisis, the housing crash, Great Recession. Boom. We are breaching that level now, but it's also showing some momentum. If this gets up higher, this is very, very bad for America. So all of the headlines can tell you that this is bad, this is good, this is bad, this is good. But I will tell you, now is the time for financial conservatism. Be careful and be conservative, and you may be, you know, renting for a while, which I'll summarize like this. What should I do? The choices are few, but pretty simple. It's going to be difficult to buy in all but a few markets. Very difficult to buy. And you've got to qualify for a higher rate mortgage. You may not even want to do that, which means there's a lot of grim pictures being painted by real estate organizations. Up to 50% of buyers are all cash. And by the way, there's only about 20 to 25% of the transactions happening that were happening a year and a half ago. So the activity is basically stopped in home buying. But up to those that are buying, half are all cash. Well, that makes sense. Mortgage rates stretch the qualification. As soon as the rate goes up, the payment goes up, and then you can't qualify. And finally, we already talked about what's happened to taxes and prop, uh, property taxes and insurance. Lastly, maybe it's just time to, if you're trying to get into a house, save everything you can, rent for now, and wait for the interest rates and the supply to change over time and make your decisions at that point. I wanted to dive into this a little bit 
you know, we're seeing headlines that cover one point, and people said, Bizdoc, can you put it all together so we can take a look at it? And whether you're watching now or a year from now after rates have changed, the stories and history repeats itself and the trend lines will come back. So this is a time to be well aware of what's going on and just manage yourself with prudence. And don't be depressed about not being able to get a house. Sit back, let it play out. The last thing you want is to stretch yourself into a house, have your job situation change, or something go on, you want to help a family member with medical expenses, and you can't do it. The best thing to do is to basically be very content with where you are, find the best lifestyle you can, and save your money, and reduce your lifestyle a little bit, and just find your point of uh, contentment in the middle of it all. And so that's where it all comes together. Um, you need to be just prudent about it. And I hope that was helpful to you. I'm Tom Ellis with the BizDoc. I love bringing you these case studies. That's this one, instead of a company, I brought it all together in one place. And if that was useful, please leave a comment. And if you're interested in something else, leave a comment on that too. I try to read as many as I can. Now, let's go back to the main studio and wrap up. Well, there you have it. That's mortgages, that's interest rates. Not a particularly great story, but it is a great opportunity to be on top of it for your life, your business, and how it's going to affect you or making sure it doesn't. I love these case studies. And if you like these, you can go check out this one, right about there, or this one, from the BizDoc Library. And every week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, be sure to check out the PBD Podcast and the home team featuring yours truly, is on there from time to time, and we love bringing you news and views that you can use. Until next time, I'm Tom Elser with the BizDoc, and I hope I left you better than I found you.